So then you went on to uh, be a test pilot. Can you talk us through this, Dan? And how, do you have to apply, or does someone come to you? No, you definitely have to. Uh, you have to put out a, an application. Um, I did so very early in my career, knowing that I wasn't qualified yet because you had to have, I don't know, fifteen hundred hours in fighters, and mm -hmm. you had to have um, multiple airplanes in your background, multiple types already. And all I had flown at this point was the F-111, you know, as far as an actual code, coded combat aircraft. And I didn't have a thousand hours yet. But I'd done a lot of engineering uh, things on my side uh, while I was a pilot. Like, um, well, for instance, I got the first ever uh, computer that you could buy. It was called an Atari 800. Basic was the only programming language. And I decided, you know, it's been, we spend four and a half hours every mission doing flight planning the manually, mm -hmm. you know, with the whiz wheel and figuring everything out. And you have to go in the back of the flight manual and look at all those uh, curvy lines and do interpolation. And you fill out your flight card, the Form 691 for the United States Air Forces Europe. And then you fly with that on your kneeboard. But everything's done manually. It took four and a half hours. But, so we came in four and a half hours before takeoff on every sortie, no matter what time of the day or night our, our missions were. And because we were a night-capable aircraft, we actually rotated and did like a, one week you'd be on morning shifts, the next week on late afternoons, and then the next week you'd be in, in the middle of the night kind of flying. And um, I thought, you know, it'd be better if we could do this quicker. So I decided to create a flight planning software that would automate this process. It wasn't an easy task. I got kind of, uh, I guess I got kind of totally uh, enamored by getting it done. And I took a Friday and a Monday off and, and worked for four days in a row without sleep and finished it and then started uh, checking it against my manual flight planning and looking at the fuel flows in the airplanes and what it was calculating. And I finally figured out that, yeah, it's really, it's working good. It's very accurate. So I took it into the squadron commander. I said, uh, hey, I'd like to leave this here and let people try to use it. It's very graphically intuitive. You're just, you know, putting in the parameters on a 691 on the screen, and then it's going to print out uh, at, after all the calculations. And so I had gone in and done all kinds of complex math called Chebyshev polynomials, to figure out how to take those curvy lines for computing drag index out of the flight manual and digitize them so that you could wow. just pick on a menu what your weapons load out today and it would compute your uh, drag index and fuel flows and so forth based on that. And he agreed that, uh, yeah, we could do that, but you know, here I am a, a first, I was, well, let's see, was I a first lieutenant yet? Maybe not. I was just a second lieutenant and there was a lot of, uh, doubts about whether a guy right out of pilot training could handle this airplane. And so I was always having a lot of pressure from the, like the Lieutenant colonels and the majors that had, you know, hundred missions in Vietnam patches yeah. on 105 or something. So I was always having to kind of prove myself and those guys, they're so just stogie cigars as their flight plan. And they don't want to do anything. They don't want anything to do with it. But some of the younger WIZOs, weapon systems officers coming right out of nav school, maybe had been exposed a little bit to a mainframe computer or something, and they decided to try it out. And literally, they came away going, look, 45 minutes and I'm done. <laughs> well, it was, a, it was a game changer. And then all of a sudden, I couldn't get my computer back. So I had to talk to the squadron commander and the wing commander to see if, if our contracting folks could purchase some computers similar to this. I think TRS-80 was out by that point, and that was something that could be purchased. And I programmed them all, and then all the squadrons had a computerized flight planning. And that led to other things. Uh, I came up with a computerized way to distribute the fragmentary order of battle. Uh, so it would come out in the command post, and typically they just ripped off part of it, and they gave it to a sergeant to go get in a pickup truck and drive around the base to deliver each unit their fragmentary order of battle. And I'm thinking, well, in combat, if we were actually under attack, what's the likelihood that pickup truck's going to make it to the squadrons to give them their targets? Mm. 
probably not real good, or if we're, especially if it's chemical warfare. So I decided, well, you know, we had these phones inside of our hardened bunkers that we, we were in when we were practicing for war. And uh, they only connected to the command post and the other squadrons. And the lines were all contained under the base, not hooked up to any network. And we could talk classified across those lines because it was secure. So I thought, well, why not have a way, because the device called a modulator demodulator or modem had just come out where you could couple a phone into a modem mm -hmm. and turn analog signals into digital and then back into analog. So I bought some modems off the British market and uh, experimented with it and figured out a way that we could have some really nice printers and computer screen and the fragmentary order of battle could be delivered wirelessly over those telephone systems. You'd call up the squadron first, say, I've got your frag, let's hook up to the modems and they both plug in their uh, telephones and then the beeps and squeak would start. start. And next thing you know, this thing's printing it out right there in the squadron and nobody had to drive around the base. So that got to be very popular with the wing commander because it streamlined and made things safer and then I noticed that we had a new radio, not the original uh, alternating current 400 cycle radio that was in the airplane originally. They had since replaced it and updated with a very small DC powered radio. It was a 24 volt DC radio. And that radio had have quick so we could you know, scramble our voice and step around on frequencies so that it wasn't easy to intercept the uh, radio calls. But unfortunately, when they put that in, they actually just put in a transformer rectifier circuit to take the AC power that had been delivering the old radio and turn it into DC. And, and yet we had huge battery that could power the thing for you know, like 23 hours straight if we wow. needed to be on DC power. But when we got in the airplane, we were literally forced to start one engine while we're waiting on our go call from the command post when we're practicing wartime procedures and we're sitting there with one engine running for half hour to sometimes 45 minutes before we got the message and we're doing that only to have the radio on and of course we had to have the um the, the intercom wasn't connected to the battery switch either the battery switch was just simply going to do you know emergency engine starts in the air and um so I thought, well, I think I can figure out a way to just go straight in from DC power into the radio. And I asked the wing commander, hey, could I have access to one of the hangar queens, you know, the airplanes that have yep. got so many parts and issues that they're not going to be flying for a while? And he said, okay. And I told him what I was going to try to do. And I wired up an airplane and fully tested it. And it worked so well that when that airplane went flying, we kept that in there and we put a, a note in the front of the 781, which the aircraft maintenance forms, that let people know, hey, you got a, uh, an aircraft that you just turn on the battery, now you got intercom and radio, and you can set your half quick, and you don't have to start the engine to monitor the command post. And so they said, you ought to submit this under the, the suggestion program, because they, they will pay you like 10% of whatever the savings was. And I calculated the savings. If all the F-111s had this, it'd be millions of dollars saved on fuel alone. So I submitted package and I actually did, I figured out how to do it for every model of the 111, the A, the D, the E, and the F. And I submitted it to uh, Sacramento, McClellan Air Force Base, where the depot was for them. And the engineers turned it down and said, it's technically impossible to do. And so it was denied. But our wing commander had the chance when our um, four-star general, the commander of United States Air Forces Europe, and of course they're out of uh, Bitburg, uh, where the headquarters was, and, and he came up to visit our unit, and my wing commander uh, showcased the command and control information system, uh, the computerized flight planning, and then went out to the hangar and had me meet with the general and sit in the right seat while he was in the left seat so he could experience this radio mod. And he said, uh, I want this in every F-111 in Europe. So that would be RAF Lake Neath with the F-111Fs and the F-111Es at Hayford. 
And I looked at him and said, well, sir, I submitted the application for it, but they said it was technically impossible. And he had a few choice cuss words and said, uh, I don't care. <laughs> and he said, I want this in every F-111 and you're grounded until you get it done. I want you to go and modify every airplane here at Hayford and over at Lake and Heat. Wow. When I looked at my wing commander, I said, well, you're going to have to give me a certified electrician, enlisted guy to go with me because I'm not technically legal to do this on all these airplanes. So I want somebody that can do it and have it signed off properly. I'll make, I'll manufacture all the boxes. I'll do all the engineering and I'll get it done. And so we did, we went over into Lake and Heath and we wired up uh, every airplane there and did every airplane at Hayford. They did let me take a flight every 45 days just to not lose landing currency and start all over again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, just, I literally did that. And fortunately for me, all of that engineering that I did that wasn't part of my job was recorded in my officer performance reports. 